I don't have a new book yet. I haven't actually, yeah. I haven't actually <laughs> pub published a book on uh, the ugly Canadian uh, Justin Trudeau's foreign policy. I plan to do it, but unfortunately, after two other books that I uh, that I already have in the in the pipeline. Um, one on the left's Canadian foreign policy, and one titled "The People's History of the Canadian, Canadian Military." Um, but, but uh, so uh, I actually, I, I know some people elsewhere had had, uh, had uh, thought that um, it was already a published manuscript, but there actually isn't. I, I, it's uh, it's in the uh, in the background of something to do, but. Um, um, yeah, but anyway, what I do have <laughs> is a talk about the, the ugly Canadian Justin Trudeau's foreign policy that, that goes into uh, the ugliness of two years in, and it's basically just a, um, as, uh, as people may have seen in the, the previous slide, it's a, it's, that was the, the cover of, uh, of uh, a book I did in 2012 called The Ugly Canadian Stephen Harbour Foreign Policy. And I figured I could save on uh, save on cover design costs by just uh, putting a uh, uh, Justin Trudeau picture um, in it. Um, but uh, uh, basically, Harper, as I laid out in the 2012 book, um, is a followed a pro corporate, pro militarist, pro Western Empire foreign policy, um, and unfortunately. Not surprisingly, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, <coughs> Justin Trudeau has continued that policy. He brought in 30,000 Syrian people, and that Okay, so sister, good. you wait till the question period, okay? <coughs> Thank you. So, uh, it, uh, yes, there was uh, maybe a positive development on the on refugee front. I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, every policy that they've pursued is, uh, is of the ugly uh, variety, ugly nature. Um, but the reality is, is that they have overwhelmingly continued Harper's foreign policy, uh, uh, the, the broad outlines of Harper's foreign policy. So for instance, as everyone in this room, of course, knows, they continued the $15 billion light armored vehicle sale to Saudi Arabia. That's a sale that they confirmed that is through a Canadian commercial corporation, a uh, uh, crown corporation. Uh, they have, uh, according to an iPolitics article from uh, two days ago, they have uh, increased um, uh, uh, semi-automatic sales to Saudi Arabia. 2015, there were no semi-automatic sales, 13.5 million in 2016, uh, uh, and in the first eight months of this year, those are already up by 67 percent. Um, uh, so they don't have any problem putting weapons into Saudi Arabia while the Saudi Arabian monarchy, uh, Saudi Arabia leads the war in Yemen which has led to 10,000 people uh, uh, dead, uh, huge cholera outbreak. Um, they, they, and, and Saudi Arabia is probably uh, the worst regime in the world. Incredibly repressive domestically, uh, uh, quite a nasty foreign policy in the region, and a major funder, exporter of an extremist view of Islam, Wahhabist uh, uh, exporting of that. The US, of course, is responsible for more violence in the world, but relatively free domestically, at least uh, compared, to, compared to Saudi Arabia. Um, so one of the worst regimes in the world. The Harper government has deepened ties with, with Saudi Arabia. Here you see, uh, this is uh, uh, Stéphane Dion, the initial foreign minister, meeting with the, uh, at a meeting of the Canada Gu uh, Gulf Cooperation Council Dialogue, which is a, a forum that the Harper government set up to deepen ties with the monarchies of the region. And, uh, and the Trudeau government has continued with those policies. These are the countries primarily involved in, in bombing Yemen. Uh, they're all monarchies, so kind of hard to make the democratic argument. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that's part of the basis of, of, um, of Trudeau's uh, policy in the region, is aligning with the, with the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council monarchies, primarily Saudi Arabia. Uh, also in the region, you look at the, their policy in Iraq, Syria, they did end Canada's role in the bombing, uh, primarily of Iraq, to some extent <coughs> Syria. Uh, they did withdraw the bombers, but they continued the refueling, the still, still Canadian Air Force involved refueling intelligence air, uh, airplanes, uh, uh, gathering intelligence. Whatever takes place in Syria, of course, is illegal. 
contrary to international law, the Syrian government did not accept it. Uh, the the, uh, the Western-led, or the U.S.-led uh, 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 mission. They, the, the Trudeau government increased Canadian uh, 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 special forces on the ground in Syria from, from about 66 to about 200. <coughs> And, um, and that's supposed to be a training mission. They say it's a training mission, and then word comes out that Canadian sniper uh, uh, had the longest kill ever recorded, three kilometers. It's kind of hard to square training mission with three kilometer sniper kill. Um, so they, they've continued that policy, they've continued a policy in, Saudi, in, 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 in Iraq of backing Kurdish forces that have been involved in the ethnic cleansing, and that, that whole policy seems to be sort of collapsing as we uh, in recent recent days, recent weeks, um, elsewhere in the region, the Trudeau government has continued this policy of isolating Canada from international opinion on the question of Palestinian rights. And uh, 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 Tara, if you could, um, uh, this is a quote from uh, an activist about uh, some of that. Basically, they've, they've opposed UN resolution after UN resolution uh, standing up for Palestinian rights, often aligning themselves with, with, uh, with, the, with uh, almost no one in the international community. And their, the extent of their pro-Israel policy is that when the Canada Food Inspection Agency uh, uh, puts forward a, or asks the LCBO to properly label a couple wines produced in occupied West Bank um, uh, that were labeled uh, products of Israel, to label them properly uh, or remove them from the shelf, um, the, the Trudeau government intervened to reverse the decision of the Canada Food Inspection Agency, so we're not allowed to even know the proper location of wines on the shelf. Not, not saying that they, you know, they, they shouldn't, they can't be uh, sold in Canada, which I think would be a legitimate position. It certainly shouldn't be able to be sold through the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement, but even proper labeling of wines is now considered anti-Israel. It's like, you know, it's, that's BDS to properly label wines, according to uh, some people out there, including some people within the, the Trudeau government. Um, uh, in May, <coughs> Trudeau said, quote, Today, while we celebrate Israel's independence, we also affirm, or also reaffirm, our commitment to fight anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, equating opposition to a European colonialist ideology with hatred of Jews or, or, or discrimination against Jews um, uh, is a very dangerous uh, 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 step for a for a, uh, a prime minister uh, of a country, and that's what Trudeau's doing. So he's he's engaged in that kind of. Um, rhetoric that you see from uh, extremist uh, uh, pro, pro-Zionist groups uh, on that, on, on, um, with regards to equating anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. He's been offside with international opinion on Palestine, but he's also been offside with international opinion regarding uh, nuclear disarmament. The Trudeau government refused to participate in the uh, UN conference titled Conference to Negotiate a Legally Binding Instrument to Prohibit, to prohibit Nuclear Weapons Leading Towards Their Total Elimination. Uh, very long name for a conference, but a pretty good idea. Let's move to eliminating nuclear weapons. Trudeau government uh, refused to participate, voted against uh, efforts, and that was about two-thirds of the world's countries that, uh, that uh, uh, participated in this conference. They, do, they, they refuse to participate and they vote against uh, resolutions uh, in this direction, um, all the while saying they're against nuclear weapons. Right? They, they are able to, they have a very amazing capacity to sort of say the right thing in certain areas and then do the wrong thing. That, that's a, that is a, a particular um, uh, capacity of, of the Trudeau liberal, liberal government. And climate change, I guess maybe another example in that, in that area. They have made improvements on climate change from the Harper government. The Harper government was going to the UN climate negotiation meetings and trying to destroy them from inside, to obstruct uh, uh, their work from the inside. Trudeau government has kind of stopped that, the, the worst of that, trying to, to just undermine them from the inside. Um, but, they, but they have, but they continue with, 
you know, a, a pipeline to the west coast to extract more uh, tar sands, heavy carbon emitting uh, uh, fuel from Alberta. Um, Trudeau himself, about uh, six months ago, at a conference of, of oil executives in Houston said, quote, no country would find 173 billion barrels of oil in the ground and just leave them, and just leave them there. <laughs> Referring to the tar sands oil, um, uh, and and uh, but that's precisely what the world needs, of course, right? Uh, that 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 has to stay stay in the, the oil needs to stay in the soil, and uh, and according to Bill McKibben, if Canada was to the well-known environmentalist, if Canada was to extract all that oil, that would be a third of the world's allocated carbon budget. Um, if we want to stay below two two degrees Celsius, um, and, and we're at 05 percent of the world's population, so that's of course a very unjust. And and it gets into the whole question of of uh, of climate, the, the equity questions of climate change. We talk about tar sands oil and staying in the ground, and the fact that it should stay in the ground. You bring up the fact that okay, first of all, it's heavy emitting, so that's a important reason for staying in the ground. But the second part, or another part of it, is that is a question of international equity. As a, as a high carbon emitting per capita country that Canada is, obviously it's a place like Canada to start reducing its carbon emissions. Uh, additionally, Canada is a pretty wealthy country. So uh, you're not going to ask Kenya to keep its oil in the ground first. You would start with the wealthier places. Um, so there's a question of equity in terms of in terms of uh, what places, what countries are are uh, are wealthy, and and equity question around around uh, a climate change that Trudeau's statement just completely uh, uh, <coughs> ignores, and um, <clears throat> with regards to uh, 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 climate change and, and uh, cap per capita emissions and sort of these equity questions. So Canada, it's important to see that, that, that Canada, compared to many African countries, is about 100 times more per capita carbon emissions, right? Um, and one of, the, one of the injustices of, of uh, climate disturbances is that those who are bearing the bulk of the, the, the brunt of the, of the toll already are generally least responsible for creating the problem. Right? So people in the, the Sahel region of Africa have done very little in terms of creating the problem, responsible for the problem of climate change, but they're the ones bearing the br brunt of the, of, the, of, of the toll. And so Trudeau's government completely ignores uh, uh, that type of uh, 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 context, important context, and, and obviously our media and the dominant discussion on climate change even ignores that uh, discussion. And, and, and it's not, this is not some abstract down, down the road uh, problem. This is already hundreds of thousands of people are dying on the African continent because uh, of climate disturbances. There's people in vulnerable positions being made even more vulnerable. Uh, it's a major killer on the continent. Um, the Trudeau government uh, has not obviously far from done enough on the question of reducing Canada's carbon emissions um, and in, in some instances wants to continue that forward and the toll that has on on people in Africa, people in Bangladesh, and, and other places. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, people want one more. He's also, so, you know, climate change as a major killer of, of, of Africans uh, already, uh, but he's also actually ba backed up the politician on the continent who has done the most, who has the most African blood on his hands, uh, Paul Kagame. And um, these quotes are from Canada's. Uh, uh, High Commissioner, and uh, they were they were picked up on by a, a New Times article, the, the propaganda organ of the, the only allowed paper, I believe, still in, in, in Rwanda, um, in a title in a in a article titled "Heads of State Diplomats Laud Kagame's Visionary Leadership." Okay, so that's the that's the sort of political impact of these tweets. Not many Canadians would have seen them. Some people would have been on Twitter, I guess, but not many Canadians. But they have an impact. That, that being the point, of course, they have an impact in terms of Rwandan politics of the Canada, again, reaffirming our support for Paul Kagame, uh, the individual who has uh, invaded the Congo on multiple occasions. We're talking about into the millions of people 
uh, killed um, uh, since the first 1996 invasion, and then when the he got rid of the regi uh, the, the regime in, in, in Kinshasa, he uh, and then the people he put in place <coughs> kicked out Rwandan troops. He immediately reinvaded, unleashed that war that led to millions and millions dead between. Uh, 1998-2003, and has repeatedly intervened in, in Eastern Congo uh, since that time, and uh, and recent recent times, recent months, uh, last couple of years, has been involved in sort of destabilizing uh, Burundi, and and operates an incredibly repressive regime uh, 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 domestically. So so here you so when I should have said this, when I should have said this I should put the preface to this, is these quotes in response to Kagame's election uh, a couple months ago, where he got 98.63% of the vote. Okay, so that's the response. It's like, great, you know, proud elections, whatever. It's, I mean, it's a total joke, of course. But even when it's just so overwhelming that it's this repressive dictatorship that runs uh, 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 um, fraudulent elections, you have the Canadian High Commissioner Coming out and and uh, and supporting the uh, um, the the regime uh, there. So this is um, this is a map of Canadian mining uh, investment uh, around the world from 2013. We see about uh, 50 over 50 billion in South America, 20 billion in Mexico, 13 in Central America and the Caribbean. 25, 24, something in, in on the African continent, uh, 10 in Asia, a fair bit in the U.S., Europe. Um, uh, Canadian, Canadian mining companies, of course, are dominant players. Uh, this city, of course, is the sort of global. I was just walking down on King Street in the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada's uh, office there. This city is is a the hub of, of international uh, mining, as people in this room probably know, and. Uh, it's, uh, it's, there's all kinds of uh, conflicts at Canadian-run mines all around the world, right? There's just innumerable examples of Canadian mines where people have been killed by security forces, displaced from their land, uh, uh, waterways destroyed, uh, all kinds of environmental uh, damage. Um, and the Trudeau government promised repeatedly that they were going to work to rein in the Canadian mining industry. Uh, when they got elected. Two years in, nothing has happened. Nothing, when I say nothing has happened, I'm talking about some very modest reforms that are on the agenda. <coughs> Something like Bill C-300, which failed by six votes in 2010, which would have ended public support for companies, or not ended, actually just restricted, limited some types of public support, for, for mining companies found to be responsible for significant abuses abroad. Uh, Trudeau government has not moved on that front, uh, that was actually a, a Liberal MP's private member's bill back in 2010, and had not moved on, on the front of, of strengthening legislation to allow uh, pe uh, people victimized by Canadian companies abroad to, be, to sue in Canadian courts, which many countries uh, have that type of legislation, including the U.S. with the, the uh, I think it's called the Tort, a uh, Tort Alien Act. No. Um, and uh, so the Trudeau government has not moved in terms of reining in any of the, uh, any of the, um, the uh, conflicts or the violence spurred by Canadian mining companies or legislation to rein that in at all. Um, and in fact has continued the Harper government's pro-mining uh, uh, company policy uh, to the point where the, the high commissioner that they... Um, they put in place in, uh, in Tanzania, uh, Ian Miles. Um, so Barrick Gold, the worst, uh, biggest gold mining company in the world and the, the worst uh, uh, Canadian, um, uh, most controversial Canadian mining company. Um, the Trudeau government, through this country's diplomatic weight behind that country, um, uh, where it's contributed its worst violence in the midst of a very intense political conflict with the Tanzanian government. So the Tanzanian government produced a number of reports uh, in the summer, May and June, <coughs> that show that Barrick Gold has failed to pay tax or royalties on billions, into the billions of dollars over the past couple of decades that they've 
basically illegally uh, siphoned off billions of dollars in, in Tanzanian resources. And um, and uh, the conflict with uh, with Acacia Mine, Acacia is the name of the company, which is a is a subsidiary of Barrick. Uh, uh, the the Acacia actually had its operations shut down in the country, and. Uh, um, the, in response to the conflict between Barrick or Acacia and the, the uh, uh, Tanzanian government, Ian Miles set up a meeting between John Thornton, the head of Barrick Gold, and President John Magufuli um, uh, to discuss the conflict. Um, and Ian, Ian Miles, after this meeting, said that Barrick uh, uh, follows, quote, the highest standards fairness and respect for laws and corporate social responsibility. So provided his full diplomatic support for Barrick Gold um, in a country where not only is Barrick Gold involved in this big uh, taxation royalty uh, conflict with the government, but their, their North Mara mine has had at least 65 people killed at it by Barrick paid security or police forces over the past few years. Uh, incredible level of violence. So I actually I wrote a piece kind of saying like, what would Barrick Gold have to do, right? Would if they if they would have stolen uh, ten billion dollars from Tanzania, and if they would kill what thousand people at that point, would the Trudeau government no longer provide diplomatic support for Barrick Gold? Like what what's the threshold? Are we going to be like hundred billion dollars, ten thousand people dead? Like what at what point would it no longer just always have the back of of uh, of Canadian mining companies? Um, it's a real question that, that actually you know, does need to be, uh, to be posed and to be, uh, um, to be figured out. Uh, on a different front, the Trudeau government released a defense policy plan in June. Uh, and that policy plan um, has a, includes the, a plan to increase military spending by 73% by 2026. Uh, it has a plan to increase Canadian Special Forces by 605 new members of Canadian Special Forces. And um, people familiar with Joint Task Force 2, most people familiar with Joint Task Force 2, Canadian Special Forces. Um, well, basically, with J JTF2 and the Canadian Special Operations Regiment, why the, the, mili the military and the politicians like Special Forces and, and have been expanding these forces, JTF2, very aggressively since its creation in 93, is that they're secretive, right? They can deploy them somewhere and we don't know what they've done. Um, and uh, yes, an element is that they are, they are uh, highly skilled. An element is that they work very closely with their American counterparts. So there's, there's a question of relations with, with the U.S. military, with Washington, that, that's part of it. Um, but a big part of it is, is, is that they're basically black op operations, right? And there's a fair bit of evidence um, uh, about, uh, about where they've been deployed. Uh, it's possible to confirm it, um, uh, but, but of where they've been deployed and what they've done. We know they're on the ground in Haiti in 2004, securing the airport. The elected president says he was kidnapped from by U.S. Marines. Um, there's a book called New Etion Invincible from a, from a former uh, JTF2 uh, member, says he was involved in all kinds of assassination missions in the former Yugoslavia, claims he was uh, involved in, in, in Colombia where uh, um, Fark. Uh, with FARC and, and, uh, and a, uh, a, uh, a trying to like rescue people that happen to be top political officials and FARC members chasing them. Um, uh, Peru during the, uh, the hostage uh, uh, thing at the Japanese embassy in 1996 with the Tupac uh, uh, Amaru, if I'm correct. Um, uh, so they've been involved in all kinds of, the, in Afghanistan they were involved in those nighttime assassination <coughs> raids. Um, so, so that's what the Special Forces is about and, it, and the Trudeau government has, has increased their, their capacities in the process of increasing their capacities just as the, the Harper government was uh, uh, saying it was going to do. Uh, also in the defense plan is a uh, plan to purchase armed drones, right? So Canada has the capacity to, you know, kill people and don't even have to have a pilot uh, engaged in that process. Uh, <coughs> also in the defense policy plan is to, is to uh, 
to openly allow for the military, notably the communication security establishment, to engage in offensive cyber operations, right? So offensive cyber operations means taking down countries' uh, 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 um, uh, electronic or uh, uh, you know uh, an internet or uh, um, spheres that could include taking down a country's electricity system, right? It's part of an offensive. I mean, anything that, that is is tied to to uh, 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 internet or or, or uh, the cyber sphere. Uh, that's a whole lot of our societies at this point. Um, so, so has, has empowered the communications security establishment uh, to to engage in in, in in offensive cyber operations. Um, shifting gears to another part of uh, of the world, um, the Harper government or the Trudeau government, uh, should I say, has has increased Canada's military presence on Russia's border. Right. Uh, 450 Canadian troops in Latvia, heading up a NATO mission in Latvia. Uh, there is a uh, 135 Canadian soldiers in Romania and uh, and four, but I think the plan is to move up to six Canadian, Canadian fighter jets there. Uh, that's not actually on Russia's border, but it's in, in the region. There's uh, 200 troops in Poland, 200 Canadian troops in Poland. There's a uh, HMCS Charlottetown in the Baltic uh, Sea patrolling in that area. This is all part of that uh, uh, so-called uh, Operation Reassurance, right? Operation Reassurance. And uh, the, the uh, top, uh, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in Latvia um, said that the Canadian troops in Latvia are going to need to be there for, for at least 10 years. And I was kind of thinking, well, I think Russia's probably going to be on the border of Latvia for longer than that. So why don't we start talking, I mean, probably 100, hopefully Russia will still be on the border of Latvia in 100 years from now, so probably these troops are going to be needed by that definition for, you know, 100 or, or 1,000 time memorial. Um, so so uh, that's the kind of kind of thinking that's, uh, that's uh, uh, driving this. It's very dangerous, of course. Um, the, 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 power, the, the power play with Russia, uh, this goes obviously against with reassurances that were given to the Russians at the end of the Cold War that NATO wouldn't move right onto its border uh, and wouldn't move east, but now it's you know, like literally right on its border and there's Canadian troops right there. Um, uh, so that's just ramping up uh, tensions in the region. Obviously, the Trudeau government has, has followed that in, in other realms, They're just in recent days with the, the so-called Magnits Magnitsky Act sanctioning more Russian Russian officials um, and and in Roma uh, and and in Ukraine as well um, can, the Trudeau government has maintained uh, has renewed the 200 Canadian <coughs> trainers in Ukraine and I just saw the actually now talk the story out about talk of actually sending a peacekeeping mission the UN mission that's obviously opposed by, by Russia and opposed by uh, parts of uh, 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 Eastern Ukraine um, and uh, uh, so that's a training mission that, that is really about emboldening far-right forces, even sort of neo-Nazi forces in the Ukraine. Um, one of the battalions, uh, one of the forces that Canada has been involved in training is the, the Azov Battalion, which is uh, viewed as uh, uh, neo-Nazi uh, um, forces that have been integrated into the uh, Ukrainian force fighting in the East. Um, so, I'm sure people in this room have heard about how uh, Christian Freeland, <coughs> uh, the foreign minister's grandfather, was an editor of a Nazi newspaper, and uh, and that's you know that's you know it's what it wouldn't be particularly a big deal except that she goes on and on about about her her grandfather, and it seems to be impacting her views of the Ukraine, her views of Russia, uh, her views on the region, and she seems to she sort of echoes. Uh, she traces some of that to to her uh, to her um, her, uh, her grandfather's um, uh, ideology, um, and and this this policy of aligning with the far right in in um, in the Ukraine is to the extent that the Trudeau government, following on the, something that the Harper government had done as well, opposed a UN resolution put forward by Russia, supported by the vast majority of the world, titled. Combating glorification of Nazism, neo-Nazism, and other practices that contribute to fueling contemporary forms of racism, 
racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. So in 2015, they were one of, I think it was only four countries that opposed that resolution, the Trudeau government. Um, and that's because it's viewed as sort of targeting uh, um, uh, forces that were aligned with in the Ukraine. Uh, elsewhere in the region, or elsewhere in the world, uh, the, the Trudeau government has pol uh, pursued uh, actually, the, the Trudeau government has pursued uh, regime change efforts in uh, Venezuela, and if you look at the Venezuelan government, there's, there's you know it, it, over the last few years, it's clearly um, it's, it's been weakened, and uh, the, the, the Bolivarian Revolution, the movement, has been weakened, and, uh, and there's clearly some, some mistakes that have been made by, by the government in terms of oil dependence, and in terms of <coughs> violence, in terms of corruption questions. Uh, there's, there's things that need to, that clearly um, uh, should have been done differently, and lots and lots of Venezuelans progressive-minded Venezuelans have put forward many of many different critiques of uh, the Bolivarian Revolution it began with Chavez and, and um, um, but the reality is this is a movement that has won 20 of 22 elections since 1998 uh, and has done a whole lot to advance uh, <coughs> the interests of the poor to empower those who've been marginalized and um, basically in the last little bit Christian Freeland, um, Canadian Foreign Policy, U.S. sees a moment of weakness. Sees a moment of weakness <laughs> in Venezuela and has ramped up the sort of rhetoric, ramped up the moves to try to uh, 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 oust uh, the Venezuelan government, um, which has really, you know, again, many many question marks. But the reality is, it's one of the one of the over the past two decades uh, done as much or more than any. Uh, movement or government around the world to advance uh, a progressive agenda, include from empowering the poor to to uh, to uh, breaking from U.S. domination, not only in Venezuela but all across the region. These are things that that the history books will undoubtedly look back on as an important movement in terms of uh, 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 shifting away from U.S. dominance. But the Christian Freeland has tried to move uh, back in that direction, and so she's repeatedly put out statements into the dozens, I think, of statements uh, or tweets critical of, of the Venezuelan government over the past uh, six months or so, uh, condemning the, the, the Nicola Maduro government at the Organization of American States, participating in this thing called the Lima Group, um, which is a handful of uh, the right-wing governments in, in, uh, in, in Latin America and Canada that, that were failed to get sanctions uh, uh, against uh, Venezuela at, at OIA, at the Organization of, American, Organization of American States, so they set up their own uh, little body to, to, go at, to go at Venezuela. And uh, <clears throat> uh, just, as probably some people in this room or maybe even at the protest just a couple weeks ago here, there, the Lima group had its meeting where um, they, they, there were, fortunately there were protests against uh, um, these efforts at pushing regime change in Venezuela. And um, and uh, but it's important to note that like while this while this criticisms of of human rights violations or alleged human rights violations in Venezuela are going on or being pursued by our government, uh, lack of democracy in Venezuela, whatnot, nothing's being said about the president in Brazil, where came to power in a, in a soft coup last year, um, doesn't have you know Maduro was elected. I mean. You know, you can say whatever, or, you know, but at the end of the day, it was elected, um, uh, unlike the president in Brazil. Uh, likewise, with regards to human rights violations, far worse human rights violations taking place in Mexico, and there's almost no talk from our, from our government on that front. Uh, so it shows you the hypocrisy, and it shows you it's, it's this continuation that the, the, uh, the Harper government um, uh, pursued an anti-Venezuela policy. At that point, Venezuela looked stronger, so it was, I think, a little bit less aggressive in some ways. Um, but uh, they pursued this, and, and they pursued this to the point of sanctioning 40, 40 Venezuelan officials, violating the UN Charter, violating uh, the OAS Charter, uh, unilateral sanctions. Then 
uh, just a week ago, the, passed the Magnitsky Act, another, I think it's 19 yeah. Venezuelan officials being, being sanctioned. So Canadians, so their assets in Canada are frozen. Canadians can't have any business or, business or financial relations with those people. Um, and, uh, and so they've pursued this, 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 this anti-Venezuelan policy. And here you have the, the uh, uh, outgoing Canadian ambassador who stepped down in uh, August, the big star who's been involved in Iraq and a number of places, considered the big star of Canadian uh, diplomatic world uh, in terms of uh, online uh, foreign policy and online foreign policy with the intent of basically building opposition. When to, was that statement made, do you know? This Wallet? is in August to, to the Ottawa citizen. So this is yeah, in, in August to the Ottawa citizen. Ten minutes. Uh, and so he is also actually worth reading the, artic the article on Ottawa citizen. He talks about Iraq and a number of other things that are quite illuminating. And also talks about how Christia Friedland has Venezuela at the top of her agenda. So, she, so he, there was some, apparently there was some uh, of the right right wing in Venezuela that was worried when worried when he stepped down as ambassador. They were worried that you know the Canadian government wasn't going to take it as uh, as seriously. We're going to continue this policy, and he was like, no, no. We assured them that Christian Friedman takes it very seriously. Whoever the new new Canadian ambassador will continue this regime change effort. So when we talk about it, we say like they, they, they he say openly talking about how we're trying to build opposition to the Venezuelan government. Um, and uh, that's the sort of uh, uh, kind of um, <coughs> rhetoric or the sort of the, the, the forcefulness which they feel that they can openly say these things about uh, regime change efforts. And we know that the Canadian government has been pursuing regime change efforts and funding oppositional forces in Venezuela going back many years, right? Uh, after the coup in uh, 2002, uh, Sumate, with that, uh, uh, forgetting her name now, Chumado, or, I forget, for the woman who had that, uh, heads the group, one of the main right wing forces that backed the coup in, in 2002 in Venezuela, um, she was brought to Canada to meet with Canadian politicians at that point, the previous Liberal government. Uh, Canada find, provided a small amount of funding to, to her, her organization. And this is all done, that's all done on, on, uh, on, the, on the guise of democracy promotion. And so there's a series of reports that talk about Canada funding different oppositional forces in, in, uh, in Venezuela, uh, alongside the U.S. obviously being the main, main funder and uh, uh, Spain and Canada being the next two. And when um, uh, asked about regime change, because there were protests against the, uh, the, the Lima conference here and because there were, I think there was also protests against the Monk, Center, or Monk School of Global Affairs, uh, a conference where uh, around Venezuela uh, a, a couple weeks ago, um, uh, Christian Freeland was asked about regime change in Venezuela, Canada sort of pursuing regime change, and her response was really quite interesting. Uh, she said, Canada has never been an imperialist power. <clears throat> it's even almost funny to say that phrase, we've been the colony. <laughs> uh, right, and so there's a number of people that point. One, somebody on my Facebook pointed out that the U.S. was also a colony by that definition. So mm -hmm. U.S. has never been involved in imperialism. It was a colony. Um, but 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 this is a, it's actually a um, it's not. This is this is a a idea that goes way further into the left. And in fact, it's kind of almost the basis of left nationalism. Um, and. Uh, and I asked, or I wrote a piece that, 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 uh, that dealt with this, and, and you say, like, so Canada, Canada was a colony, kind of like Kenya was a colony, right? That was about the equivalent? Uh, no. In fact, if you look at Kenya, you'll find that the violence meted out by British imperialism was far worse. Um, Europeans was more of a settler state uh, than, than, than a colony. Um, in Canada, and and uh, and Can Canadians have long been associated with the with the empire, right? The British Empire historically, Canadian elites were very well integrated into uh, uh, the British Empire. Access to finances, universities, military might of the British Empire. Uh, so to call it a colony is is is, uh, is absurd. On the other hand, the that that idea of Canada being a colony uh, sometimes was referred to Canada's relationship to the U.S. Right? Was Canada a colony vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. like Haiti has been? I mean, the U.S. marched on December 
17th and to the, uh, uh, 1914, marched into Port-au-Prince and took all the country's gold, put it on a U.S. vessel, and brought it to American Bank in New York. That, I don't think something quite like that uh, uh, happened here. The U.S. occupied Haiti between 1915 and 34, kept control of Haiti's finances until 1947. So Canada's never been a never been a colony of the U.S. in anything approaching something like that. And Canadian foreign policy, Canada, has been aligned with uh, uh, the Canadian elite have been aligned with the U.S. elite. Uh, very close relations for the past 50, 60 years. Um, and Canadian elite have uh, uh, view the world and profit from the world in a very similar way to the to the U.S. elite. So, so. Because you feel, I was, I was actually happy that she brought, she made that quote because it kind of, I think, brought up some questions of, of, um, uh, I think there's some questions around uh, left nationalist understanding of the world that that uh, it's good to have it come, that the words be put forward by a foreign minister that mo most people would would uh, most progressive people wouldn't have uh, too much uh, positive to say about. Now, why is it that the Trudeau government's foreign policy? as followed so closely with the Harper government's foreign policy. Well, why is it? The, re the reason um, it's followed so closely in part is because there's almost no opposition. Right? Can you do the next slide? That is the NDP's foreign affairs critic, <coughs> Emile Navadier. That is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee um, meeting last year, 2016, in Washington. Um, she was down there to speak paid for by APAC to speak at the conference. Uh, also last year she did an event at the Jewish National Fund in Israel, explicitly racist colonial institution. Um, uh, in, with regards to Venezuela, uh, Elena Lavadier uh, in 2016 put out a press release calling, uh, decrying the erosion of democracy in Venezuela, called on Ottawa to quote, defend democracy in Venezuela. More recently she put out a, a, a statement uh, can, uh, t or attacking the Constitutional Assembly in Venezuela. She's been pushing the Trudeau government from the right on Venezuela. Um, it's not too dissimilar her position on, on Ukraine, uh, Syria, Venezuela, Palestine. She has aligned with the U.S. Empire. Uh, she is a long-standing she was an employee of foreign affairs for a long time. She was a diplomat, a Canadian diplomat all around the world. She won something called the Foreign Minister's Award for her contribution to Canadian foreign policy. Um, so this is who the NDP sees as the right person to have as the critic on foreign affairs. Let's just say that's not exactly a sign of an oppositional kind of uh, uh, demeanor. Three minutes. And um, and so you, so you get into the question of, 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 of the lack of opposition. Okay, okay, go further than that. The Rideau Institute, right? Who heads the Rideau Institute? Mm -hmm. Kind of sort of one of the main left-wing foreign policy uh, uh, organizations in the country. Peggy, Peggy Mason. Peggy Mason boasts, not well, a few years ago, that she works with NATO. She trains NATO forces in UN peacekeeping. Um, I think she might still do that today, according to her LinkedIn profile. Um, uh, that's not exactly opposite. Not really type of background. She was she was 30 years. She was a long-standing. Uh, she worked for Joe Clark, the former Brian Mulroney's foreign foreign minister. Long-standing UN. She was a, 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 a sub uh, diplomat, a uh, sub uh, ambassador to the UN. Not the main Canadian ambassador, there's multiple ambassadors to the UN. Um, uh, uh, she's somebody who's been in that world for decades and decades, got all kinds of connections to the foreign policy establishment. So there's, there is very little, the, the, you know, the mainstream, well, the, obviously the NDP, uh, 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 labor unions even, and I, I'm working on a book about the left foreign policy, or finished a book about the left foreign policy. Um, uh, the, the mainstream, uh, 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 the, the main uh, uh, anti, uh, ma the main left-wing organizations um, uh, uh, are not, don't take a critical posture in foreign policy. And I'm just going to, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll just, just say one, one element of, of just a sign of this. Okay, so during the NDP leadership race, 
Um, at the end of the NPP leadership, leadership race, I went and look, looked at Charlie Angus, Lee Caron, Jagmeet Singh, and Nikki Ashton's websites on foreign policy. Not one of the issues or priorities of Charlie Angus, Guy Caron, or Jagmeet Singh touched on international affairs. Mm -hmm. Not one of them. That's right. Okay. Nikki Ashton did a little better. She had uh, one thing that called for a section calling for a just peace in the Middle East, and one of her 14 priorities was ensure that Canada is a voice for peace in the world. Right? Um, the NDP leadership race, foreign policy questions, questions of Canada to NATO, questions of military spending, basically not on the agenda. Palestine, actually, that was the one area that sort of did get on the agenda a little bit because Palestinian solidarity groups were pushing it and because Mulgair had gone off into such crazy territory. Um, uh, but so little, so, so, so the, there is just so little opposition on this front, so the Trude Trudeau feels it's you know, open terrain. And that's about, that gets back to us. And how do we build the social movements, the organizations, the political forces that provide somewhat of a countervailing force on foreign policy, um, and it, there's no uh, there's no uh, 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 recipe, exact recipe. The main question is work. Uh, that work that many have done over years and continue to be doing today in terms of building the Palestine Solidarity Group, building the Mining and Justice Organization, building the the uh, uh, African Solidarity Groups, Haiti Solidarity Groups, um, uh, the anti-imperialist organizations. Uh, and uh, and that's that's the fight that that is a it's a, it's a very important fight, uh, uh, and it's one that's not being taken uh, seriously enough by enough uh, progressive-minded people. And uh, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Okay. So before we open up the, our Q and A, uh, a couple of announcements. <coughs> And first of all, I should have done this at the beginning and I didn't.